The following content has been provided by RWTH Aachen University. Today we're going to first look at um, a system that can solve that problem. And maybe, I don't know, maybe you guys have, I'm sure you've actually already seen it somewhere in computer science in the uh, more theoretical modeling oriented classes. What would be an alternative notation that we could use that is really good at modeling these kinds of concurrent, you know, vari variable options? In state charts we have parallel uh, states. Uh -huh. State charts, yes. And we will actually get to state charts in a little while. Um, they are, you're absolutely right, they are a, a way to deal with this parallel stuff going on in a very sort of pragmatic, engineering-oriented, uh, practical way. There is another model that is a little more theoretical, a little sort of cleaner, if you like, from a, from a uh, design standpoint. Um, yeah? Um, one could model each, um, each button, for instance, using a SDN and then build the product automata. Mm -hmm. so you, but then you are using a shorthand notation. I, th I, I think somebody wrote this down as like, he drew the first uh, STN and then he made a little X and then he drew the second STN and said, yeah, well, those two are combined. Um, th th was that you? Okay, uh, so that's a, that's a smart way to notate it. Um, and it actually sort of kind of reflects or is, is similar to what you do in state charts and when you draw them kind of next to each other. Um, but we still have that, you know, in effect, that if you really were to write down that automata, you'd basically still have the state explosion issue. So there is a different notation that we can use um, that actually deals with concurrency really well. Any ideas? It's the name of a guy who also got famous for making these small glass dishes in biology labs. Yeah. Based on your headline, I would say PetriNet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was like the title of the lecture. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's also the title of the lecture. That's the ultimate hint I'm giving you. Okay, yes, PetriNet, of course. So they are a much better approach to dialogues than um, you know than, than modeling things with, with state uh, transition networks. Um, they don't work so well if you're trying to do things sequentially. So like with regular expressions and production rules for different kinds of interactions parts, you use different notation. And by the way, in reality, you'll just combine these things as you need them, right? So if you have a part of a dialogue or an interaction that needs to be written down in a sequential way that matches that, use, this, use it as TN. If you then get to something that's highly parallel, use production rules or maybe petri dance. Um, they are actually a pretty old <coughs> formalism to model concurrency, model it really in an excellent way. Um, so question would be then, Raise your hand if you have never seen Petri nets in any of your classes in your formal university education. Okay, that's interesting. All right, so where are you guys now? Oh, okay, um, I'm I'm surprised. Most most uh, courses cover this, including the bridging courses we do for international students uh, from other programs. But um, I, I'll give you an introduction, and it's not that hard to understand. The, 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 the principle is very simple. What's hard is to actually use it to model stuff. Um, so let's look at this. A, a Petri net is basically uh, has a couple different components. One thing that you have is a place. So all these things that we used to call states in the SDN are now places. And that's important because the state of a Petri net, or the, the state of an STN, is basically defined by what's the currently active state, right? That's, that's how you know how, which state an SDN is in. That's how it's defined. With Petronets, it's more complicated. It's actually the distribution of little tokens around the network that, as a whole, makes up the current state. And that's something that's super easy to forget, but you will need this to do the in-class exercise that we'll be having in a minute. So um, this is a normal place. This is a special place that we draw that where, where user input goes. So if the user does something, we put a token in here that's modeling the user action, basically. Then these places always go to a transition. They never go directly to another place. So there are no arcs between places. They always go over one of those bars, these transitions. And from the transition, they then go to one or more outgoing places. Now, the cool thing about Petrinets is that these transitions are actually not just, you know, piping through stuff. A transition will wait. And this is the key mechanic of a Petrinet. A transition will wait 
and look into all its ingoing sort of places until all of them, so this one and this one in this example, contain a token. If they're all loaded, the transition fires, as we say, it pulls the token out of all these ingoing places and puts one into each outgoing place. Now, if you paid attention, that means that tokens can disappear or magically multiply, right? Because if there's only, if you put two in here, these two get consumed by the transition, they disappear, and only one gets placed into this outgoing one. Right? So a transition fires when all its input places have one or more tokens inside, um, and that produces a token in each output place. Um, and the representation of all the token, the, the, the position of all the tokens in combination represents the current state. That's important to understand. Uh, very different from, from the state machine. Um, okay, so that's the general idea of Petrinets. So, given that information, we're back to the exercise. I'd like you to try and draw a Petrinet that models this dialogue. You can start first, like last time, maybe first just draw a Petrinet that only models bold. I highly actually recommend starting with just the bold part for now. So draw a simple Petrinet that models the fact that this dialogue can have bold on or bold off and that the user clicks on it in order to move between those two states. Remembering that the distribution of tokens in the network is the state of a Petrinet. Do this with your neighbor or your neighbors and uh, let's spend a few minutes on trying to get that uh, sorted out. And then extend it with a second option, italics. And that's where the Petronet will start paying off because those are two concurrent things, as we noticed, and you won't have state exposure. The first thing to remember is the Petronet will have a to token somewhere distributed in its net, and the total of those tokens represents the state, and these user places that represent user input cannot have ingoing arcs. Because the only way a token can get into a user place is by the user doing the corresponding action. Right? So there's got to be a user place somewhere that represents the fact that the user toggles the bold button. And it doesn't have an ingoing arc. The second thing to realize is um, whether the user toggles the button to turn it off or on is actually the same action. He toggles the bold button. So there's really only one user place that represents the one thing the user can do, clicking on the bold button, no matter whether it's currently on or off. It's always the same user action. So ideally, you should have only one user input field, or one user place, where, the, where a token can go every time the user toggles the button. Um, and with that, you will then probably end up with something like this. So this, this network works as follows. Um, it has two normal states, uh, places, sorry, I keep saying states, places. And in this case, it's kind of similar to a state transition network because we only have one token circulating here. And when the token is in this top state, place, sorry, it will represent that bold is on. If there's a token in the lower place and none in the top place, that represents bold being off, right? So whether there's a token here or here, models the fact whether the dialog is currently, you know, that checkbox is currently checked or not checked. Now, if that was all I had without this extra thing here, this thing would continuously fire, right? Because this transition would be like, oh, I've got a token in my input, so I'm going to fire and put one here. And then this transition is, oh, I found a token, I'll fire and put it here, and it would just circulate. So that's not the idea. So instead, um, what, ha what should happen is that we need to stop these transitions from firing immediately. And we do this by adding the user place that represents the actual action of the user. So we connect the second place to this transition and to this transition. By doing that, it means that both of these transitions cannot no longer fire immediately. They have to wait for something to go into this token, uh, into this place. And that's the token that means the user toggles the button. So when the user presses bold, toggles the button, then this transition can fire because it has tokens in both its ingoing places. This one cannot because it doesn't have one in here. When this fires, it consumes this token and this token. Um, and I think we have an illustration for that. So 
here's the token. Um, this is basically the UI place, and this is the um, place where the input can occur. So we now put a token here. That means that this transition can now fire when, because all the inputs ha uh, places have tokens. We have an awesome fire effect. <laughs> the tokens disappear, and um, a new token is put into the lower area, right? And then it does the same thing again. You know, when you put another one here, the same thing will happen and put the token back up there. So far, so good. Now, how many of you got to this, this part? How, how many of you got this kind of, um, well, okay, it's pretty good. Um, what do we need? To, yes, go ahead. Can you do the same transition for the both interactions? Like if we remove the T2, and there will be T1, and there will be back and forth. No, uh, because then your transition, your one transition, would have more inputs. And it will wait until all its inputs are loaded. And it would put stuff into all its outputs. You see what I mean? So if you, you're, you're saying, uh, could I basically put this one back onto this transition, right? Yeah. Now, um, no matter whether an arrow comes from here or there, basically it's just the transition will look for, uh, for all its incoming arrows and wait for them. So these, these transitions don't work in like two directions, right? They, you can think of it like it will look for all incoming areas on this end and then fire stuff in this way. And if it will also look for incoming stuff from here and then fire in that way. Um, they are not directed, right? So they will just look at all their incoming arrows, no matter where they come from. If they're all loaded, it will fire tokens into all its outgoing um, arrows. Okay. So how do we now create um, a dialog that also models italics? Should be pretty straightforward at this point if you look at what we just did here. Yeah. We made the same thing for italics. Right, right. And uh, I've seen this on, on, on your guys' paper here already. Um, who else has, has found a solution for bold and italics? Okay, this was a little trickier, but uh, once you've gotten to this part, it's kind of obvious. You just duplicate the thing. Right? Because, and why does this work? It's because of that one thing that Petri nets have that is, that is sort of very different from, say, transition networks. A Petri net is you know, the state of a Petri net is represented by all the tokens in the network. The distribution of tokens across the entire network as a whole represents its state. So in this case, the fact that there's currently a token in here and that there's currently a token in here together models the state italics off, bold off. And that is one state in our original state transition network. Remember, we had, when we drew it, there was one state that was bold off, italics off, and then there's one like bold off, italics on, and, and so on, and so on, and so on. And so here, the distribution of tokens around the network together represents that state. Now, you can say, well, not a big payoff, because I see four places here, plus these two user places, and you know that's not better than the state transition network. The state transition network for this only had four states, right? Um, so where's the big deal? Um, but you can tell me where the big deal is. Well, we only go, go, grow linearly. So if we now add underline, then we only get uh, three more states or places. And if we then add another like line through or something, then we get other only three and we don't grow exponentially. Exactly. So each additional option that we create here, because it is modeling the state as the total of the tokens distributed across the network, will only add one of those bundles here. right? So if you have another checkbox, it will just put another one of these figures next to it. Not only does it only grow linearly, which is nice, as we all know, but it also is very clear what's going on. right? You have a very clear representation. This is the italics functionality in the dialog. right? So you're modeling the, the parallel things very clearly apart from each other, which wasn't really the case with the state transition network. right? In the state transition network, you had all these different things mixed into each other in each state. Um, so. And we kind of try to make, tease them apart by putting them in different dimensions, but somewhere beyond four dimensions, even I run out of good visualizations. So um, this is a much cleaner approach to showing that stuff.
This content was provided by RWTH, Aachen University.